So when I was 27, I got my PhD in physics, and it was really fun. I got to study how the universe ticks. I got to work with other researchers and students and some people to help us make it happen. It's basically a small group of really smart people, and um, it was a real fun for me. But I could have stayed an academic, I could have stayed at the university doing this kind of thing, but life changes on you. And one of the big changes that happened to me was I got to learn a lot more about climate change. And this is what that means. What you have here is a spiral showing the, ink, the excess temperature on the planet every month since 1850. And you can see that it's slowly increasing over time here. And it's getting faster and faster and faster towards two degrees. So now we're in 2017, we're almost at 1.5. Now, why does this happen? This here is the carbon cycle. Now you don't need to understand this slide in, in all its detail. The basic things you need to get away from this is that there's constantly carbon dioxide moving in and out of the natural environment. And on the most important ones to focus on are the ones that we affect. Over here on the right is fossil fuels and cement production. That's cars and transportation and heating your house. All that is burning fossil fuels that's putting extra CO2 into the, into the atmosphere. So it's changing the carbon cycle. And on the left, we're changing the landscapes around us. So for agriculture, we're changing landscapes, we're cutting down rainforests, things like that, and that's creating more CO2 or other greenhouse gases, and they're all going into the atmosphere. So the balance that was there before is changing. Now, what does it mean to put greenhouse gases in the atmosphere? Well, the way that planetary scientists think about this is in terms of energy balance, okay? So you have all this energy coming from the sun, and it shines, it bounces off the top of the atmosphere. That's why we look like a blue planet from far away. And some of it goes through and warms up, and some of that light bounces back up into space. Okay. All that light that's coming onto planet Earth has to be balanced by energy coming off of planet Earth. Otherwise, it would just explode. Okay. So what's, what's going on over here is we have both sunlight coming back off or infrared radiation. Infrared is the kind of radiation you get from hot objects. If you've seen infrared camera and movies, you've seen the kind of people moving around that they're, you're looking at the infrared coming off of their bodies. In this case, infrared gets bounced off the atmosphere. It's like a blanket. And when you pile up greenhouse gases in this atmosphere, the blanket gets thicker. Now the way the blanket works is you get warmer and warmer under the blanket until you're warm enough that enough infrared is making it through the atmosphere to balance out the energy balance. Okay? So that's kind of the science of this. The atmosphere is a blanket around the planet, and when we add greenhouse gases, we make that blanket more effective at keeping us warm and maybe too warm. Well, um, just how warm are we talking about? Well, we measure CO2 in parts per million. Now that, does, that seems really small, okay? Right now we're in about 400 parts per million. But CO2 can have very big effects on the, on the planetary temperature from what I told you about before. Every time you double CO2, you increase the long-term temperature of the planet by a few degrees. In this slide here, that's quite colorful, you get a sense of where we could be going by 2100. So in the top scenarios, these are scenarios where we have warming of three to five degrees. Now, three to five degrees increase in this room may not seem like much, but that's the difference between like an ice age and no ice age, okay? Those are big differences for the planet. Now, this happens if we just keep emitting and we get to 1,000 parts per million of CO2. These scenarios on the bottom, these are the good scenarios where we, man we manage to keep the temperature on the planet in a reasonable place. And planetary scientists think that these are the only ones where we avoid suffering, where we avoid major problems in the future in your lifetime. Now, if you look at this line, this is not talking about the total pile of CO2 in the atmosphere. It's talking about the rate at which we're adding stuff to the atmosphere. And you'll see here in the blue lines, by the time you're in 2060, by the time you guys are my age, we need to be taking CO2 out of the atmosphere, not even adding anything else to it. And if you delay this kind of progress, 
you're still adding to the pile. You're making the blanket warm, bigger, you're making the planet warmer, you're creating more drought, more storms, more sea level rise, etc. in the future. Now, what causes all these emissions is us. So each one of us has a role to play in what we emit and what kind of things we consume and what kind of technologies we use. But really one of the main drivers here is how many of us there are. Right now, we have about seven and a half billion people on the planet. By the time we get, this is, these are projections from the United Nations as to kind of where population is gonna go. By the time we get to the end of the century, we could be looking at 16 to 17 billion people. We're not even sure how we could feed that many people, but that certainly will be a lot of people emitting greenhouse gases. Or we could be on a low trajectory, the green one over here, and then we'll be plateauing at around nine billion people, somewhere around 2060. Again, around the time when you guys are my age, you could be seeing something that's never been seen before in human history. You could be see the end of growth. And nobody really knows what that means, but that's gonna be pretty amazing. Now, all these humans on the, on the planet, we're, we're also creating other kinds of problems. We're, we're coming up against other, what they call planetary boundaries. Okay, so in Stockholm, the Stockholm Resilience Institute kind of made a survey of some of the major things that we're pushing up against. So here, you're seeing biodiversity loss. Right now is a big issue, nitrogen cycle. And you see the climate crisis in the middle getting bigger and a whole bunch of other things, okay? These are all challenges that you guys are gonna be having to deal with within your lifetime. Now, I think one of these, the freshwater reuse, I, uh, I found a kind of particularly visually striking example for you guys today. This is in Uzbekistan. These are, these are fishing boats from a town, a port city on the Aral Sea. The Aral Sea was one of the four largest freshwater lakes in the world. But right now, this doesn't look like a sea, does it? This is the Arokum Desert. The Aral Sea has shrunk because it's not getting enough fresh water in it anymore. And this used to be a fishing community, and now it's dozens of kilometers away from the borders of the Aral Sea. But look, it's not all doom and gloom. We have a lot of control over our future. There's still a lot of things we can do. Those scenarios, we're in charge of them. Are we going for those yellow lines that go crazy or are we going for those blue lines? And there are solutions that exist today. So now I'm not doing physics, I'm working on energy policy and one of the things I'm working on is to bring things like these windmills and solar power into the electricity mix faster and faster so that we can clean up the power, the power grid and not emit as much fossil fuel for electricity. We can also combine that with, with other technologies and to make a functional grid that works better for us. And also we can work on wasting less energy. And wasting is a big part of the problem that we have to manage. We can also take this clean energy from wind and solar and we can use it for things like transportation. That's called electrification. We take things that we used to do by burning fossil fuel, we use clean electricity to do it instead. So look over here, this is a battery electric bus. Okay, this thing can go a couple hundred miles just on the electric charge in its batteries. So it's clean and it's quiet and it's not running on a diesel engine. And these are technologies that are, that are here today. So there's plenty of ways for us to address the climate challenge. It's not so much about personal virtue, it's about working together to find solutions for society. But we also are already seeing the effects of climate change today. Okay? This huge image here, and you see outlined some of the islands underneath. This is Hurricane Irma. This happened this September. This is a picture from September 8th. The winds in the middle of this hurricane were 185 miles an hour. Now, I'm sure you guys have put your hand out the window in the car when you're going 30, 40 miles an hour. It feels kind of cool. You do this, up and down, up and down. Imagine winds if your car was going 185 miles an hour. And that's just the winds that people were experiencing. That's a crazy hurricane. This is a Category 5 hurricane. And the weird thing is, a month later, there was another one, Hurricane Maria, and it hit Puerto Rico. And people in Puerto Rico still don't have water, still don't have electricity in many parts of the island. They're still 
reacting to this hurricane. Now, climate change didn't make these hurricanes happen. Hurricanes have always happened. The thing that climate change does is it heats things up. I mean, when you heat up the ocean, you're basically creating more fuel for the hurricane. It's kind of like having more fuel for a wildfire, more heat in the ocean makes a stronger hurricane. They make makes them meaner. And so we're starting to see stronger and harder to deal with weather events already. And this is just the beginning. So to recap here, to, to deal with climate change, we're going to have to really change our behavior. We have to change the way society organizes. We have to be on those blue curves where we're taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere by the time you're my age. So we're either going to change the way we live and the way or societies organize pretty radically in your lifetime, or nature is going to do it for us. So that has a lot of implications for you guys. So I wanted to, to finish this talk by giving you a sense of what this means for you. Okay. And I'm not trying to get you out there to go and recycle or whatever. I, I, I'm trying to find a message for you guys right now about what this means for how you should organize the course of your life. And I'd like to take some cues, some clues from what's happened in my life. So I used to be an academic and work with a very limited set of people. And then I changed the career, my career. And now I work with a whole bunch of different people. And my work, there are people with different skill sets, people that are lawyers and economists and public policy people. And then outside of work, I talk to journalists, I talk to politicians, I talk to investors, I talk to activists, a whole lot of different people. So working with different people is a really important part of being successful. And in the changing world that we're going into, it's going to be a really important part for, for you guys. And it's going to, so it's, it's two things. The first part is being flexible. Right? I had to change from what I was doing in physics to something else. So a lot of knowledge that I had as a physicist, not so useful to the, today for me. But a lot, but I still got to take the skills and the ways of learning as a physicist, and I got to bring them into a new arena, and that was fun. The other thing is, I had to learn to communicate more. I had to work with people that were different from me, I had to write a lot more, I had to get up and give TED Talks, and hopefully you guys will do a better job than that, than, than I can. And, and so, it's really important that you guys learn to find your voice, like who you are, but it's also really important that you learn how to sing with other people. So, good luck. <laughs>